is, I would say it's not full, it's not complete in that this would not be um, the level of difficulty I would expect tomorrow, but it has a lot of pieces in it that I think you should be able to do. For example, um, do you guys all see that there's like, uh, I'd say this is part one and part two and part three. Do you guys see that? Like we're looking at three stages of what happened. And between part one and part two, there is conservation of momentum, that the momentum of the system will remain the same. And the reason we know that is because although there's an external force of gravity acting on the system, it acts the same on all objects and doesn't accelerate the system. And I have a clear point of contact where there is a shared force acting on two objects. So that's, these are the kinds of things that make me think conservation of momentum. And it's a collision. However, momentum is not conserved when I look at part three to from part two to part three, because once the cable begins applying a force to the system, that's an external force. But the fact that gravity is acting on the system suggests that the mechanical energy will be conserved because that external force is a conservative force. So mechanical energy is conserved from part two to part three. It's not conserved from part one to part two. The collision doesn't conserve energy because the forces that act on the objects unfortunately take away some of that energy from the system. But mechanical energy is conserved in part two to part three. That kind of sets up a roadmap for how to answer question A and question B. And none of that has anything to do with simple harmonic motion. So if we look at part one, the momentum of the system is just the first mass times its velocity. And during the collision, I have two objects, but they are joined together. So they have a combined mass times their final velocity. So doing the math on this, this will be one times five equals one plus one times V final. So our final velocity, two meters per second, I'm sorry, 2.5, told you I'm making mistakes all day, 2.5 meters per second. Okay? So that means this is 2.5 meters per second. So let's take a look at part B. In part B, we're asked, what energy does the pendulum have after the collision? It's a trick question in a way, because the pendulum actually begins at this moment. Oops, can't circle something when you use the eraser. At that moment, that's where the pendulum begins. That's the bottom part of the pendulum. And after this, the system begins to swing upwards. The energy of a pendulum stays the same unless something takes it out of the pendulum. So the energy I have here will be the same as the energy I have here, or even anywhere in the middle. So if I know the energy at any point during the pendulum's motion, I know, that the, en I know the energy the pendulum had. So for this problem, what that suggests I should do is find the kinetic energy of the system at the bottom right here because that's gonna be the energy of the system. The pendulum doesn't have any potential energy then, all the energy is in the form of kinetic. So the kinetic energy at this point is the energy of the pendulum, that's gonna be one half times the mass, which is two, times the velocity, which is 2.5 squared. Can't forget to put the mass as two here. So half of two is one, and 2.5 squared will be 6.25 joules. And that's the kinetic energy of the system. We good to go? Question C has nothing to do with any of this. So question C is the only part of this that has to do with uniform, I'm sorry, simple harmonic motion. So I get rid of all these things here and look at question C, which states, if it oscillates twice per second, what is the string's length? Now, this is the part that in sixth period, people had a little bit of difficulty 
kind of figuring out what I was trying to say here, but I, I'm giving you the frequency. I'm saying it's two oscillations per second or two hertz. Now, once I say that, I'm also saying that the period is half a second because frequency and period are inverses of each other. Now, it doesn't matter which formula you use at this point. You need to figure out the length. So whether you use period equals 2 pi times the root of L over G, or you use frequency equals 1 over 2 pi times the root of G over L, you're going to get the same answer. And it doesn't make any difference which one of these you choose to use. But um, if you guys don't care, then I'm going to say 0 0.5 divided by 2 pi squared times 10 equals the length. I don't know what that is, but it doesn't really matter. It's, not, it's going to be a pretty short pendulum. Any questions about this? Guaranteed, one of you screwed up the divide by 2 pi thing. I know, Victoria, you're shaking your head. But trust me, I guarantee I'm going to see that when I look at all the quizzes. Somebody's done it. I know because somebody already did six period and we caught them on it. So it happens. It happens. Is really what you need to worry about. I think the kind of style question you need to worry about are going to be things that are more focused on simple harmonic motion. If you're looking to study tonight, I am planning on putting a practice question out on Edsby. And I'll, I'll include the solution to it. But what I want you to think about is it's still going to be short. We're still looking at a 10-minute question. And be aware that, you know, questions that are like in the homework. There was one of them in the homework that I think bears at least a little bit of, of discussion because people have asked about it. It had to do with one that was talking about a pendulum and said, if I have a pendulum that is oscillating and I want it to oscillate with twice the period, what would I have to do with the length? Now, it was a multiple choice question, and the answer has got to be four times greater. I'm glad to see three or four of you put four fingers in the air. You know, we can't forget that that kind of problem is pretty prevalent on the exam. And for those of you who don't remember how to do it, there's a couple different methods, but the method I would probably tout here is solve for the variable they're asking about. They're asking about the length. So if you solve this for length, you'll get, you know, period divided by 2 pi quantity squared times g. Then consider what's changing. They're telling you they want a doubling of the period. So 2t over 2 pi quantity squared times g. Then factor out the number part that changed and try and collect everything that looked like the original function. That means taking this 2 and popping it out of here and getting 4 times t over 2 pi squared times g. And remembering that all of this equaled L a moment ago. So that means if you want to double the period, you need 4 times the length. We've done this in class. It is in class a lot first semester. But for something where there's the square root, they love asking this kind of question. And I would be remiss if I didn't try and reinforce that on a quiz. In this problem, they are specifically saying that the acceleration as a function of time is a sine omega t. It doesn't matter that they use sine here. Remember, you don't have to have it be cosine for a. It's just that if your position is related to, to, to sine, then your acceleration will be related to sine. And we know that this constraint is the constraint that determines how the object actually oscillates. And like I said, that constraint is usually something physical about our system. You know, for a pendulum, this is going to be g, square root of g over L. For a spring mass system, this is going to be a square root of k over m. And there are lots of oscillating systems. What we usually will get here is some kind of physical properties that determine how the system operates, and we just abbreviate it as omega. 
makes it look easier in our in our expression rather than having to put square root of something over there. All oscillating, um, all simple harmonic oscillators have this controlling feature that determines what the period will be. And so I've said it a couple times, but I want to reinforce it. This is called the angular frequency, and it's in radians per second. Now, if nothing else, you should be clued into the idea that if that's in radians per second, and I want something in oscillations per second, then I need to convert the radians to oscillations. And there are two pi radians for every oscillation. So you could treat this like a conversion problem, and that would be just fine. Or you can be reminded that frequency equals 1 over 2 pi, and it's always been whatever the part is that's in the, the inside of our trig function. That's what's always gone here. So omega, which means frequency equals omega divided by 2 pi. Again, this should not be a surprise. This is showing radians per second being converted to oscillations per second. I'm taking my thing that's in radians and dividing by 2 pi to get oscillations. Is that coming through, big chungus? Just checking. So I don't remember who asked this question, but hopefully you got your answer. Anything else? Oh, you're welcome. All right, guys. I'll post the practice.